Welcome to the Sky News Daily Podcast with me, Dermot Murnahan. Thanks for joining us as we examine the story beyond the headline. Now, 2020 has been the year where lockdowns, social distancing, working from home and telling your colleagues they're on mute became something of the norm. The COVID pandemic has also had huge repercussions for businesses and has been possibly the biggest political challenge faced by a government in peacetime. They're fighting a war here and they're losing. A disaster, a tsunami. It's a recurring theme now. Everyone dies alone. You've got masks, gloves, overalls. They've just been left there. Can you level with us how many people do you think will actually die? You must stay at home. They're going to do everything they can to save him, but the odds are stacked against him. I don't want to be a statistic to this. <sighs> do not care who you are. It, it, it takes you down. Boris Johnson has tonight been admitted to hospital. I just got better, and he didn't. This used to be a theatre. Now it's just a storeroom. We're having to struggle to get this equipment in place. It's appalling, really. I wonder if you will take this opportunity to apologise. A first for British Muslims. Ten burials, one straight after another. It's the biggest day that we've had in terms of falls since 1987. I've got to get out, I've got to get some fresh air. I can't take this anymore, I can't go on. I'm sick and tired of this. When is this going to stop? They ruined my results. This is not what I deserve. You can see him just there, running across the Downing Street and out the back gate. How is it? How? Biblical. <laughs> And it just brings a little bit of joy to a lot of people at a time when that's exactly what they need. You really want to give people a hug every now and then. This is a day to remember, frankly, in a year to forget. It's all for Britain, that's right. <laughs> Hopefully, it'll help other people to come along and uh, do as I did. What a year it's been. Joining me on this special episode of The Daily Sky's economics editor, Ed Conway and Sophie Ridge. I mean, say what a year it's been. Unprecedented, extraordinary. We run out of words, don't we? But, I mean, first of all, you know, how's it been for you guys? Everyone's been affected personally. I mean, is there anything in your domestic life that has just, you know, changed utterly? Well, I don't think I've ever had an experience, I'm sure you guys are the same, where your work life and your personal life have so completely collided. So what we're reporting on now is what we're talking about with our friends on WhatsApp. It's what we're experiencing with our families. Mm -hmm. And it feels to me like everyone is going to have a different experience of the year, whether you live alone, if you have a young child like I do, you know, that has a huge impact on um, how you found the last year and, and lockdown. It's just been yeah. Yeah. a life-changing year. What are you everything, personally? Ed? Everything's kind of blended into, you know, work and, and personal life have, have blended into one. And... Well, it's just, you know, the same for, for, I imagine, you know, millions of people that, oh, yeah. around the, the country trying to, you know, we, we, you set up a kind of barriers between the two. And, you know, I find that kind of difficult at times. Because... Listen, I, I mean, one thing is we're all in work. I mean, that, that, yeah. that's, you know, we're going to talk yeah. about the economy. Yeah, that's right? very true. I mean, very I'm true. at the other end of the, of the age scale from you guys. So the way it affected me was with my, my mother. She's in a home and I saw her in... You know, it's hard to remember. I think I saw her just before the lockdown, about the 5th of March, and then Blimey. I didn't see her. I wasn't allowed to see her for the, almost the entirety of the summer. And I tell you guys, you know, I don't want to start on the downer, but the deterioration in her mental position because of the lack of contact has been quite marked. You and, know? And, that, and, 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 you know, and I know this has happened you know, to millions of families around the country, and this is, this is what we've been dealing with. What about... Um, Working from home, you've been in the studio a lot. We're going to talk about that. I've been in the studio a lot, but actually, but also, you know, we set up a kind of a rig at home so I could do stuff from my my study at home. Yeah. Constantly living in fear that my one of my two daughters is going to come in. We're going to get on to uh, you and your enormous list of data charts shortly. But first, um, that moment that changed the way we lived our lives in 2020. We all remember this. Huge numbers are complying, and I thank you all. The time has now come for us all to do more. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. All together, isolating and staying indoors, obviously as instructed, but it's just the fact that we've got little, little or, no, or no space, 
it's bit, it is really, really tough to deal with because normally we'll go out to the park, um, get some fresh air, but, you know, now we're just cooked up inside and we have little or no space to store food as well. That's another challenge. It's destroying parents' mental health because there's no places to go. You're scared to go out. It, it's stopping people from wanting to go out. How many mental healths are getting destroyed? How many families aren't being fed? How many children aren't sleeping at night with worry? OK, well, let's look at the lockdowns. And, Sophie, I mean, I, when, when I heard that clip from Boris Johnson again, I mean, it brings it all back. I remember I was coincided with, with Sky News tonight. I was put outside Downing Street. It's just down the road here. And we kind of knew what to expect. I mean, it had been well flagged that lockdown was coming. But I remember when he announced those words, it was like an electric shock. Yeah, it's like you felt like you were living through history. It, like, this is something that people are going to be talking about in decades, that we've been told to stay at home. And I remember I, uh, probably about a week before, had had a conversation with some people at Number 10, and they were like, yes, you should be scared. In fact, everyone should be way more scared than you are right now. Everyone will know people who get ill from this. And that was my moment when I was like, oh, my goodness, this is... Mm. This and there, is was that, there was that point pre the lockdown, that was March yeah. the 23rd, as I remember, but there was that kind of shadow period when you, yeah. you, know, when, when you had the pubs open, but don't go to the pubs. Yeah. And, and there was that sense... And if you, I mean, drill down into this anymore, there was that sense that the government was going to try a different route, what's mm. now been called the Swedish model. Do you, mm. do you get a real sense that that was the way they were attempting to go and then they, yeah. then they really saw the numbers? Totally. I think that's right. And also, I think what we have to re remember as well is that the sage advice early on was actually very different to what we're getting now. I, I mean, for example, they were saying that mass gatherings, when I mean, we remember Cheltenham, well, they were, the sage scientists were saying that actually there's very little evidence that these really have a big role in transmission. I mean, look how wrong they were then. And, and the mask use, face masks as well. Yeah. Um, that there's people were saying on TV at the time that actually maybe they make transmission worse because people aren't wearing them properly. It just is a big reminder, I guess, of how far we've come on that. And, and Ed, I remember you and I in this very newsroom early on in that lockdown having a conversation. I came across to you and I said, how can we afford this? And remember, the initial lockdown was three weeks. It was going to take us up to Easter. It was the, it was the original yeah. circuit breaker. It was to save the NHS, to, yeah. to build this space. And I said, even three weeks. I remember saying to you, you know, give me ballpark figures. How much is this going to cost? And oh God, I don't know what I said to you no, about that. No, I mean, even then, it was but for three weeks. It looked mind-boggling. It was, it was, it was extraordinary numbers, and that's kind of where we've ended up. I guess you know what what policymakers would say is that even if we had followed the Swedish model, the damage would have been as great, if not greater, because there would have been so much concern that people just wouldn't have gone out and behaved as normal. So it's not, it's not a question of life would have been the same, we would have had some economic gains, it's, we would have had even more economic catastrophe and more deaths. That's the argument. The, the reality is the entire world has had to go on an enormous learning kind of mission here. And a lot of stuff we got wrong, a lot of stuff. And still are, yeah. and, you know, and, and, still, and are. still learning. So for electric moments, a prime minister the night the Queen spoke to the nation yes. shortly after, and clearly everyone wanted all attention on Her Majesty. Mm -hmm. Then it comes, overshadowed it. People have almost forgotten that address. The Prime Minister was taken to hospital. Two days later, he's in intensive care. It was extraordinary. That time was... Ext I mean, it was electric, like you say, those electric moments where you just take a breath. It's almost like a breathless moment. I think we all remember uh, that when the Prime Minister did go into intensive care has been one of the clearly um, most memorable moments of the crisis. It was quite frightening, I think, because Boris Johnson wasn't yeah. old. Yeah. Uh, you know, OK, he was and a bit overweight. And as he admits, obese, yeah. But um, at the same time, this is the Prime Minister. He's one of the most public faces that we see on TV almost every day. He's in intensive care. And yeah. then also, I think it's only a few weeks afterwards that we realised there was a vacuum in government at that time. I remember we were told that, you know, he had his laptop there and was watching with Nail and I and joshing with all the stuff. We later found out, you know, he's putting in an induced coma and yeah. he he's, needs help breathing. Why not tell us that? I know, and the statistic, you know, we could all see it from the statistic. And a lot of, actually, the weird thing is a lot of my job has been just looking at the numbers and trying to ignore all of the words around them. And in that case, the statistics were saying that, you know, he, there was a very significant, a tangible chance that he might die in intensive care, that it was very real. And when you looked at the outcomes that we've seen in intensive care, um, particularly for those who are overweight, 
it was it was not good. Just a quick one on this while we're on this on this section is of course you know the economic response and, and, and from both of you I mean you know the speed at which Rishi Sunak and that Treasury team designed in particular that that furlough scheme a word again we weren't particularly familiar with I mean Ed were you impressed? I was yeah no I was impressed and I think you know a lot of people actually interestingly you know Dominic Cummings spent a lot of the last kind of year or so saying try essentially trying to kind of get the Treasury out of the way because they were seen as being in the way. They weren't seen as being a kind of fast, responsive unit if you had a crisis. They weren't seen as being particularly imaginative. And yet, in the crucible of this enormous crisis, it was the Treasury that were kind of very quick to formulate something that was totally unprecedented. And I remember, you know, we talked about it on those evenings when, when the news came out. This was an unprecedented policy and, you know, yeah. And, and, and to the extent that it's touched everyone as well, you know, it is to some extent a bit like a wartime situation where millions of people are directly affected by a government policy in a way that actually they very rarely are. Rishi Sunak, you must have talked to him on uh, on, on the yeah. Sunday show. I mean, he was, he's, he's a rookie chancellor. I find it fascinating. I remember when uh, Number 10 were first pushing him on the Sunday show, we were like, who's this, Rishi, this is before <laughs> COVID, who's this Rishi Sunak guy? You know, can't you give us someone more, you know, famous or well-known? They were like, no. He's going to be a star, trust us on this. And to be fair, he is one of the emerging political stars of the crisis. Yes, I take the point that in the years to come, will his star continue to rise? Because that is when many of the very difficult economic decisions are going to come on the recovery, on the way out. But right now, you've got to say that Rishi Sunak is somebody who has, in 2020, has, has been one of those more reassuring political figures mm. for people. Let's uh, concentrate now on some of the data that informed those decisions. We must keep reducing the incidence of this disease. We must keep that R down below one. And that means we must all remember the basics. Wash our hands, keep social distance, isolate if you have symptoms, get a test. Sage has advised that a circuit breaker should act to reduce R below one, should reset the incidence of disease to a lower level, and should set the epidemic back by approximately 28 days or more. For every day that we release, uh, we'll need two days of tighter restrictions. So coming into Christmas, we need to be very careful about the number of contacts that we have. And then I think once we have got past the Christmas period, we will all have to be very responsible and reduce those contacts again. OK, now we're concentrating on the data. So it's got to be you, Ed, because you spent so <laughs> many <really> hours. <laughs> I mean, it must have added up to, to weeks in front of those screens. And, and just let me ask you, first of all, personally, I mean, obviously, you know, you've got this huge economic brain. W was it easy then to, to turn it? Because you're used to dealing with data. Was it yeah. easy then to turn it to all this medical and scientific stuff you were dealing with, the R8, et cetera, et cetera? Weirdly, yeah, loads of the stuff that I've been doing this year has been about the numbers. What do the actual numbers tell us? Yeah. And is it any different from what the either the scientists or indeed... Um, the sceptics are, are saying but that's, the, but that's the thing, Ed, that, you know, I mean, I know you, you ventured onto the bear pit that is Twitter with this data, and that's I only follow you because I have to, because you're a <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, I mean, there, there, I mean, there it's so many big divides. There's such a divide about the data. It's what you touched on earlier, pure science. Well, you've got these numbers, but people interpret them in so many different ways and getting so cross and angry about I it. I think so. Well, but, but rightly so, given the stakes, you know? Yeah. This is people's livelihoods at stake. And I think, you know, I've, rarely is it that, that there's been an issue which has been so data-centric that has had such a tangible, immediate and sometimes, you know, really terrible impact on people's lives. And I think people are scared. We heard, particularly when Dominic Cummings was there, they had this kind of NASA-like setup with the data just coming in from, from all over the place. And that, remembering it now, that's then when we started this, this tier system. And then you get these regional divisions and some people saying, well, hold on a minute, your incidence level or your R rate is higher than us, but we're in a higher tier than yeah. you. It's, it's really difficult. difficult. And, and, and there are different things to weigh up. So obviously it does feel incredibly unfair if you're in Seven Oaks and you've got really low incidence rates uh, and yet you are being put in a higher tier than many of your neighbours. You know, it's happening in places in Derbyshire and Lancashire all over the country. I had, I remember talking to one politician though, uh, the MP for Oldham, it was saying Oldham's got a very high uh, rate. 
one of the problems that they had in Greater Manchester at the beginning was that the, 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 it was too small the areas. They had different rules in different areas. People were confused. The messaging was very difficult. So, and that they were criticised for that. So it's like you have to balance all these competing things. And I, I think in some ways that is why it's been such a difficult crisis for politicians because there are. It is very on the one hand this, on the other hand that. There's no easy solutions to this. Now, we spoke of the human cost of COVID-19 in the first of these special daily podcasts, but the economic cost has been a high price for many as well. Today, I can announce that for the first time in our history, the government is going to step in and help to pay people's wages. We're setting up a new coronavirus job retention scheme. Any employer in the country, small or large, charitable or non-profit, will be eligible for the scheme. It's great to hear what the government are saying, that they're going to support us, which has actually taken a load off my shoulders because I thought, I could, you know, I could lose everything. You know, I could... 28 years of being in business, and it's just... But I've now got a positive head on my shoulders. It's a horrible, horrible situation to be in. It's, you know, it's, it's worrying about... How long is it going to take him to find a job? There's 800 applicants for one job. How, how do you compete with that? On that basis, it, it, heaven knows when he could find a job. Well, Sophie, I mean, just first of all, characterise for us the, the divide, and there is something of a divide within government. You know, we understand, I mean, as, as, as he should do, the Chancellor is constantly yeah. referring to the damage that the economy is suffering. And there are these constant tensions, aren't there? There are, within? definitely. I think what's interesting is even in the core sort of quad, if you like, of government, there are, there are these splits and we can see them. We know, for example, that Rishi Sunak is increasingly concerned about the economic impact and then you have Matt Hancock on the health side. Now, of course, in a way, you'd expect the Chancellor to be worried about the economy and the House Secretary to be worried about the health. But I, you've seen these kind of switches in the middle too. So Michael Gove, for example, it feels like he has drifted more and more to the Hancock side of the argument. There's also big questions about Boris Johnson starting off kind of on the kind of Rishi Sunak end, but then, of course, got very ill, became much more concerned uh, about the uh, health risks of COVID, more in favour of the lockdown. And I think f now we can see the Prime Minister perhaps edging back more into the Rishi Sunak camp. Ed, I want to take you back to those charts. And again, you know, these, these searing memories there must have been for you when you were pointing to some of those charts. I mean, with GDP hitting the floor, and I think the historical comparison was sometime in the 18th century yeah. or something like that, the, the hit. But, I mean, the... the 1709. Really, yeah, OK, thank The you Great Frost of 1709, I, 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 you know 18th that. century. But, I mean, the truly awful one is, is unemployment, and there's so much more of that to come through the system. Yeah, I think that's all right. And, you know, even now, you know, towards the end of the year, it's still... We don't quite know how bad it's going to be, and partly that's because just unemployment takes quite a while to go up. Uh, and partly it's because it's difficult to tell, you know, because the furlough scheme has come in and it is an extraordinary intervention. It's supported millions, millions of people. You know, we just heard from some of them there who, who might otherwise have, have lost their jobs or, you know, not being able to, to pay their bills. So the scale of it is massive. Um, the amount, the impact on the government's finances is, is massive. But also it just means we don't quite know how bad it's been across the economy as a whole. And we probably won't until the furlough scheme comes to an end, you know, in the March. If you talk to people in the Treasury, they're really concerned about the longer term impact, not just of the furlough scheme, but also about the revolution in the workplace we've seen. So increasing number of people working from home, obviously that has a huge impact on city centres. It also means that if you're working remotely, then when the next you know, job reviews come up, you're not just competing against people who can commute into the office, you're commuting against, against people around the world. Let's uh, stay with the politics. It's fair to say the government would probably rather forget uh, some of these moments. Let's have a listen. COVID-19 isn't a surprise. Um, it's not happened overnight. We knew that it were coming. Um, and why we're having to struggle to get this equipment in place is it's appalling, really. There is understandable anger, but a lot of that anger is based on uh, reports in the media that, that have not been true. A lot of people would say that I, that I ought to have called the Prime Minister. I have to make, make decisions, and sometimes I make, do the right thing, and sometimes I, I make mistakes. I got BBC, but I was expecting AAA, so <laughs> they ruined my results. This is not what I deserve. 
OK, well, let's examine those lessons learned. Well, Sophie, do you think they have been learned or they're, they're still learning? I mean, we just touched on a few of the... I mean, the extraordinary number. Are there U-turns? There's been confusion on messaging, which has been absolutely damaging uh, throughout the pandemic when you need people to understand a clarity of message. And I think it's in particular, you know, we heard from the exam situation there, that for me was one of the most av avoidable uh, crises of the last year, actually. Uh, they should have seen that coming. There's no reason why they shouldn't have realised that if you don't sit exams, how are you going to mark people? Uh, is there a bias towards private schools, which there was in the system? I, I feel like the education side of this is where they really but did just on the hand, I mean, we've got the Dominic Cummings, mm. one of the clips in there. I mean, the handling of that, it seemed to fester for a long time and then he went anyway. Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's no secret, is it, that the Prime Minister expended an awful lot of personal capital keeping Dominic Cummings in place, and then he went in the end anyway. As, as you say, was it worth it? I think, in retrospect, you might say no. We talk so much about the new normal, about things will never be the same again, but we saw, you know, after the financial crisis, I, I remember saying similar things. It pretty much, you know, when things got a little bit better, they pretty much reverted to the norm. What are your thoughts on that? I feel that we are potentially becoming more appreciative. And I can probably see you guys oh, rolling your eyes. No, I, I agree. Think we are. Yeah. I remember the first lockdown when I got my first takeaway coffee. And I honestly, I remember skipping down the high street. I was like, <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, well, listen, I had... Uh, like I, such a treat. <laughs> I, like a lot of people, had a 14-day quarantine, you know, when you're not even allowed yeah. out, of your, out of your front door. You yeah. can't even exercise, which I find a bit <laughs> weird. I mean, you know, that 15th day. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you know, yeah, imagine the whole country. Just walking down the street. Yeah. The whole country. So that's the Roaring Twenties thing, isn't it? You know, actually, although we're all a bit... Everyone's a bit nervous now, Maybe when they're finally unleashed, then yeah. it's an extraordinary summer. Get your dancing summer. shoes out, Ed. Yeah, finally. <laughs> to, go with, <laughs> to go with your socks. Ed, Sophie, thank you both very much. And that's it. Until next time, head to Sky News for the latest on the COVID fight back. Lots more information, analysis and explain us as well on our mobile app and social channels. Thanks for joining us for this edition of the Sky News Daily Podcast, hosted by me, Dermot Murnahan, and produced by Annie Joyce and Mark Thompson. And don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or whichever app you prefer. And if you've enjoyed this, please do leave a review.